today on Teach Me How to Vegan. And then of course, think about your dark leafy greens. This is a huge one. And again, bioavailability, we mentioned that earlier. You get about 30% bioavailability with cow's milk and you're gonna get rates of up to 50% or more with certain dark leafy greens. And so dark leafy greens, again, bonus without the baggage. With dark leafies, we've got all this calcium and we've got just literally hundreds if not thousands of other components in these foods that are making our health even better when we eat them. Welcome to Teach Me How to Vegan, a podcast where we explore how to switch to a vegan diet. I'm Tony, a health educator, fitness instructor, and plant-based eating program manager for Animal Protection of New Mexico. I'm Mickey, a stay-at-home homeschooling mom and vegan cook who likes to play in the kitchen. Our family stopped eating meat in 2007. And we went vegan in 2016. Now we like to share with others what we've learned. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Gabriel, for joining us today. We have a another great discussion in the works. Joining us today is Gabriel Garden. For those who have not tuned into our previous episodes with him, first of all, you're going to want to go back and check those out. We talked all about protein at length, and we also talked about soy in the past. Also, Gabriel Garden is a registered dietitian with a master's degree in public health and a steadfast dedication to sharing the best in evidence-based nutrition science. Welcome, Gabriel. Tony, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. It's been too long since we've been together, and so this has been long overdue. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. And so today we're talking about calcium, and we're going to get in, uh, into the weeds of calcium. We're going to talk about wh- how much calcium you need, what are some sources of calcium, uh, which ones we might prefer over others, and why and what we can do to ensure that we have, you know, optimal health in areas related to calcium. So, you know, talk about our bone health specifically, and if there's anything else that we might want to think about around this topic. So if you've been concerned about your calcium intake or where you're going to get calcium from or thinking about it as you're switching to a vegan diet, stay tuned for this conversation. So first off, I thought we could just start out by talking about how much calcium we need. So what are the recommended daily intakes for calcium? Yeah, let's do it, Tony. So yeah, the right. So there's a bunch of different terms. There's adequate intake and, you know, the recommended dietary allowance and the upper tolerable limits and all these different things that are probably just sound confusing to people. And even as dietitians, it's hard for us sometimes to remember these unless we talk about them all the time. Um, And so calcium is one of those nutrients, right? It's a mineral that we do need. So it's essential. We, I mean, essential means we have to consume it in food. And the term that we use for that is the recommended dietary allowance or RDA. And what that is, is it's basically an estimate that, you know, scientists and researchers have, you know, that specialize in determining nutrient needs for populations. That's an estimate that's supposed to cover the, the average requirements for about 97 to 98% of the population, right? So pretty much everyone can be guaranteed that based on the estimates that, you know, these, these professionals have come up with that they're going to get their needs met if they meet those numbers. But that being said, right, these are all estimates. And so that's an important takeaway is it's with many nutrients, it's sometimes people become, can become overly anxious or worrisome about, you know, many of us, we just don't even think about it, right? Because we're living our daily lives and we're just going to McDonald's or, you know, popping our Beyond Burgers better than McDonald's, you know, in the, uh, on a pan or something or on the grill and we're just eating food. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the folks that do worry about these things, especially if they've gone to the doctor and they've been screened and they say, oh, wow, you know, your bone health, you know, we're talking about calcium. And so calcium is one of those key nutrients when it comes to bone health. Uh, it looks like your bone, you know, mineral density is one thing, right? That's showing like how strong or how dense our bones are is a little low. And so you may want to think about a calcium supplement or you're just um, not even screening, right? You may not have even had a screening for your bone mineral density, which can be expensive. You may just be somebody who's say going to be pregnant, or you may be a child and you go to your pediatrician and the pediatrician says, oh yeah, you know, we want to make sure this kid's getting enough calcium. And so generally speaking, the little ones for any nutrient are probably going to need less, right? And so little tiny ones, um, zero to six months, 200 milligrams. And 
you know, again, you should be getting, if they're breastfeeding, they're going to get everything in their breast milk that they need. And then of course, a formula is going to have that in it too. For babies that aren't breastfeeding, they're going to get that in their formula. And then once they start incorporating foods after seven months or after six months, I should say, uh, it goes up to 260 in both males and females or boys and girls. And then one to three, there takes a big jump up to 700 milligrams. And then four to eight, it goes up to a thousand, right? So these are just still little kids, but since they're growing, the RDA, the recommended dietary allowance is still as high as it is in adults. So that's the same 1000 milligrams in both four to eight year olds and fully grown adults. But the time when it really changes is when you hit adolescence, right? So nine to 18 years of age, so kind of the preteens up through the teenagers, they're going to need 1300. And again, because of this rapid takeoff in, in development and in this, you know, specifically our growth rate in our bones, our bones are growing like crazy. And so it's estimated that we need higher amounts of calcium during that time. Same in boys and girls, again, 1300 milligrams. And then for adults, 19 to 50, the numbers are still a thousand, right? And, um, and then they stay the same for men over 50, 51 to 70, there's still a thousand. And, but for women, they jump up to 1200. So a little increase in women uh, between 51 and 70. And then above 70 years of age, their men and women are both at 1200. And I thought this was interesting because I thought I remembered that either pregnant or breastfeeding women needed more. Uh, but according to the data that I just looked at from the National Institutes of Health today, Yes, pregnant and lactating girls, you know, that are still teens are going to need that 1300. So they're going to need more. Uh, but according to the NIH, the National, National Institutes of Health, pregnant and breastfeeding women between the age of 19 and 50 still have that basic 1000 milligrams per day. So they don't need more calcium during, you know, and there are certain nutrients that you need more of when you're breastfeeding or when you're pregnant, but calcium does not appear to be one of them. I found that interesting too. Yeah, I was looking at that same, the same source. And uh, I, I thought for sure it would go up because your calcium or your calorie needs go up, right? When breast, when pregnant or breastfeeding. So interestingly, you don't need to up your calcium per se. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're going to come to this probably throughout this conversation, but Generally speaking, right, it's like we've talked about this a lot during the protein episode. We don't have to worry so much about these individual nutrients if we consume a well-rounded, varied diet, right, that has a lot of different food groups, a lot of different types of food in it. So if you have loads of beans and seeds and grains and nuts and, you know, dark leafy vegetables, you know, and other cruciferous veg and fruits, right, and mushrooms, all these wonderful plant-based foods, if we're consuming a variety of these things, we don't have to worry so much about the individual nutrients, you know, especially with something like protein. Calcium may be a little different, right? Because if you're not getting some of these calcium packed foods in, then there's a chance you may be low. That being said, realize that these reference dietary, these recommended dietary allowances, right? Which are supposed to cover the needs of almost, you know, 97, 98% of the population. They're estimates that are kind of country specific. So if you go to the UK or if you go to other countries throughout the world, their recommendations for calcium are going to defer. And in many other countries, the, the, the amount of calcium for their RDAs or whatever their equivalent is, is lower than it is in the United States, right? And so people would say, well, why is that? I mean, are, you, are people in the UK or Australia or India that much different from people in the United States? I would say no. But those populations may be different in terms of their body mass index, right? So in terms of the amount of weight that they're carrying around on their bodies, in terms of their exposure to sunlight, right? Because vitamin D, and we'll probably come back to vitamin D a number of times during this conversation, is incredibly integral to our bone health, right? Both calcium and vitamin D, but without enough vitamin D, you know, bone health, our, our chances of having healthy bones, you know, it's going to struggle or there's going to be more risk for osteoporosis, osteopenia, these diseases of degeneration in our bones. And so there's a lot. And of course, physical activity is a big piece when it comes to bone health, right? So some people want to concentrate on, oh, am I taking my vitamin D supplement? Am I getting enough calcium? But they won't think so much about exercise because that's another thing we struggle with incredibly in the United States is our sedentary lifestyle. 
And so we're all sitting around on the couch. And even if we're, you know, taking our supplements, right. And we're drinking our cow's milk, or even if we're drinking, ideally our calcium fortified soy milk, which is much better than calcium fortified, uh, cow's milk, we're doing an incredible disservice to our bodies if we're not exercising them, right? We've got to stress the bones. We've got to get, we've got to do resistance training and we've got to do other forms of weight bearing exercise, right? So think walking, but even then eventually if you're walking and you can't run because of joint problems, arthritis, whatever it might be, too much body weight that you're carrying around, Walking's wonderful, right? It's an essential form of human exercise. It's something we've done as long as humans have been around. We walk and we can do it with efficiency. We can do it with ease. It doesn't cost us a lot of energy to do so. But you'd want to graduate toward, you know, putting on a weighted vest or a weighted backpack because that's still going to provide some of that additional weight that you need with even though you're not running where you're coming down on each step and you're getting, you're providing much more impact for your bones to cause them to remodel and to stay strong and to keep them from degenerating or breaking down. Um, something like a backpack, right? Or a weighted vest can help a lot with that, right? So those are just some of the other things that play into why we may or may not have healthy bones, right? Exercise, vitamin D, that sun exposure that comes through vitamin D. Um, eating a well-rounded diet in general, all of those things. So I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, like you said, if you look at different countries, the recommendations are different. And I, I remember reading about at one point in our country, the recommendations just shot up and I wasn't sure why. And some people talk about like maybe we all don't need to aim that high. And so that really sheds a lot of light on it. It sounds like it's important to have our calcium intake, of course, but it's also very important to think about the other lifestyle factors that factor into our bone health. Totally. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think in, in most cases, right, there are certain cases where if you go to the doctor and again, this isn't meant to replace medical advice. Of course. In many cases, it's probably better than the advice that you're going to get to a doctor. But that being said, it's not meant to write, you know, we always have to put the, the qualifier on there. Uh, it's not meant to replace the information that you're going to get from your medical professional. And so if you're struggling with any kind of health problem, you need to go to your doctor and you need to take their advice. It doesn't mean you have to follow it, but you definitely need to consider it seriously. And if your doctor, if you're somebody of a certain age, right, like over the age of 50 in women, when there tends to be higher risk for, you know, osteoporosis and osteopenia, or if you're uh, somebody else who's either super underweight or super overweight, there's all kinds of different issues. Um, but if you go to your doctor and they say, oh, there's something going on with your bone health, uh, we recommend you take um, a calcium supplement. Um, that is a thing in and of itself. But for most people who are just going through life who haven't gotten to that point, whether because they haven't hit a certain age where we know that the risk really increases for osteoporosis, or they just don't, they're not experiencing any other issues with their muscle, you know, with their skeletal system, any kinds of random pains or things that might happen. Then instead of worrying about a supplement, I think it's ideal in most cases, right, to try to just be mindful and try to incorporate foods that are rich in calcium, of course, plant based foods ideally, uh, so that you can. Uh, make sure that you're getting a good amount. You know, that's something that, again, even me as a registered dietitian, somebody who's pretty obsessed with nutrition, I'm not a numbers guy though. I'm one of those people that, again, I try to consume a wide variety of foods to the best extent that I can, right? Based on my budget and time constraints and mot other motivational factors and all the things that play into, you know, uh, when it comes to mealtime, what we decide to put in our mouths. I try to do my best to have a wide variety of foods and I'm trying to, again, in variety, we're going to be so much more likely to increase our chances of meeting all of our nutritional needs. We get that good variety, but we can maybe jump into next unless you have a, another question based on what we've already mentioned, Tony, uh, what some of those foods are, you know, that oh, people can aim for. That's exactly what I was thinking. We're on the same page because that's one of the main reasons that I wanted to do this episode, because when people are switching to a vegan diet, Calcium is one of the first things that we think of because a lot of us associate calcium with dairy and nothing else. It's similar to the protein thing where we asso we associate protein with meat, maybe beans or and nuts, you know, 
But other than that, we don't really think of any other foods as containing protein. Whereas we learned in the protein episode, you can, as long as you get enough calories with a variety of other things, your protein adds up from your greens, your vegetables, even fruits. And it's kind of, it's surprising to a lot of people what foods contain protein and in what amounts. And I think that calcium is similar. You know, a lot of us, we think it's got to be dairy or it's got to be fortified soy milk or almond milk or something like that. But yeah, tell us more about what other, what other plant foods can we get calcium from? Awesome. Great question. And, and that's another segue too into people will talk about dairy as being like the best source, right? Or the Mm -hmm. primary source or the source that has the greatest bioavailability. And that just means that if of any nutrient in a food that our body's best able to absorb it and use it, if it's highly bioavailable, and so they'll talk about the high bioavailability, uh, bioavailability, excuse me, of dairy. Uh, and so folks know the general absorption rate for calcium in dairy hovers around 27%. People would say, uh, you know, around 30% if you want to just round up. And so 30% of the calcium that you get in dairy. So I think in an average cup of milk, I think it's somewhere right in the high 200s or around 300 milligrams of sodium, right? So you can compare that, right? You and I are both adults between the ages of 19 and 50. And so generally speaking, based on the American reference dietary intake or refer- dietary re- dietary recommended allowance. See, these, these, these things are just crazy hard to, hard to remember, mm-hmm. but the, the American RDA will, you know, or the American, you know, estimated need for calcium at a thousand milligrams for us as adults. If you drink one cup of cow's milk, you get a, you know, almost a third, right? Three tenths of the amount of calcium that you need in a day. And of course, just so folks know, if you're going to the store and you're buying a plant-based fortified nut milk or soy milk or whatever it might be, if it's fortified with calcium, you're usually going to be getting a similar amount. You know, it may be a little more, I mean, maybe a little less, it may be spot on. I think it's often spot on to what you're going to get in a cup of milk. So it's just like a nice equivalent. Hey, you can expect the same amount of milk in this soy milk or this almond milk or whatever it might be that you can in your dairy milk. And sometimes I think as probably a sales gimmick, some of the plant-based milks, I think will put even more calcium, then you'll find in your, your, you know, dairy milk, which again is around 300 milligrams per cup. And uh, as far as I can tell, it's probably just a sales gimmick as a way to say, Oh, you want to get your calcium in? Well, we can give you even more bang for your buck than dairy can. Yep. So yeah. And that's a great way. I've heard some really wonderful, you know, you know, folks in the nutrition space recommend, especially for like growing kids, right? When we know for you and I, it's not as big of a deal. We're not going to get any taller. Our bones aren't going to get any longer. We're just trying to maintain the bone mineral density, right? The strength of our bones that was already built up, you know, as we reached adulthood. But now that we are already at a certain age, our bones basically are just deteriorating over time. And through, you know, our nutrition, through our vitamin D status, you know, and through our exercise and things like that, we just want to do everything we can to maintain that bone mineral density over time. Um, But for kids, of course, who are growing, that's super important. And so, especially for them, it's like, hey, why not, right? Most of us grew up drinking cow's milk and we got all that, that, those, that high amount of calcium as we were growing, uh, why not make sure that our vegan and plant-based kids are basically put in the same space? Yes, emphasize the whole foods who have the calcium that's naturally found within, you know, that's going to be kind of um, probably most safely absorbed, uh, most safely housed in these whole natural foods than it is when it's added to a product, right? But it's certainly not harmful added to a plant-based milk. And it's going to ensure that kids get enough, you know, so just make sure they get a cup of uh, one, one product that's really great that people highly recommend is called Ripple. It actually uses, it's a plant-based milk. It uses a pea protein. And so it like soy milk is going to be nutritionally very similar to cow's milk. But again, bonus without the baggage. That's a term that we've used in other podcast episodes I picked it up from Michael Greger, wonderful physician. You should all check out nutritionfacts.org because when you're not listening to our podcast, you should have other great places to, or I should say AP and M's and Tony's podcast. When you're not listening to this podcast, you need to have other places that you can go that you can get great evidence-based, you know, research that is broken down and digested in a way that's bite-sized, that's easy to understand, that's accessible because none of us 
you know, have the time, no average person has the time to go through the thousands and thousands and thousands of research articles that there are, you know, on a even monthly basis, probably, but certainly an annual basis to find out what the latest is, you know, in all the science. And so Michael Greger does that all. It's completely um, free from the bias of, you know, corporate funding and uh, all that stuff, right? It's completely independent, which is really cool. So go to places like nutritionfacts.org to get more information about things like calcium and anything under the sun that you can think of that's related to nutrition and health. A uh, little side note there, but super important that people know uh, good places that they can access this, you know, life-saving information. And so where were we at, Tony? We were talking about plant-based sources of calcium. Yeah. And just what are, what are some of the foods? Because I think like, again, you know, I think some people are going to be surprised. I'm always surprised when I go back and look at these lists, you know, like if you're not drinking cow milk or if you're not drinking fortified milks, where the heck are you getting your calcium from? Oh yeah. I was talking about ripple. Yeah. So ripple is a good one. The, the reason, one reason that some folks, whether they come in from, you know, just, you know, whether they're on the animals industry side of things, or they're just skeptics, or they're just average people who are trying to figure things out, like we all are, they'll rag on plant-based milks because they'll say, oh, well, they're not giving you all the nutrition that animal, you know, that the cow's milk will give you. And so two that really stand out are soy milk, because soy milk is one of the rare few, if you look at most of the nut-based milks, the seed-based milks, the rice milk, they all happen to be really poor when it comes to the amount of protein. You know, they're really low in protein, but soy has just as much, if not even maybe a little bit more protein than cow's milk, but very similar, right? Basically the same. And it has a, a good amount of fat, but of course with soy, you're getting the healthy fats. You're getting the bonus without the baggage that dairy carries of the saturated fats, the animal proteins, you know, the hormones, uh, all the other things that dairy is going to carry in it. You're not going to get that with soy. You're just going to get the bonus of the wonderful plant, phy the phytonutrients, which are super protected for health, the poly unsaturated and unsaturated fats, rather than the saturated fats in dairy, which are super damaging for our, especially our cardiovascular health. But yeah, so ripples great because it's got the same protein. It's got the calcium loaded in there. Of course, go for the unsweetened varieties as much as possible, because again, a lot of these alternative milks have quite a bit of sugar in them and there's nothing wrong with a little bit of added sugar, but we all need to watch out, you know, to not consume too much added sugar. Soy milk and ripple are like the two that I know of that are like nutritionally right on par with all the good things that you're going to get in milk, but they don't have all the bad things that you're going to get in milk, like saturated fat. And then what else, right? Tofu, again, it has to be tofu that's been set in calcium sulfate and most tofu is, I think it's probably, I don't know how often you can find it, but half a cup of tofu, right? Which isn't a ton of tofu. It's easy to eat, put it up in your stir fry, you know, make those great, um, the slices that you'll use. And then you'll use your tomatoes and everything else. Tony, that you guys make those great, like sunny side up or kind of yolky eggs, which mm -hmm. is just a slice of tofu to create your egg whites, right? There's so many great ways to use tofu. People think it's plain. No, it's not. You just have to do a little bit of online research and a little bit of practice, and you'll learn how to use it in a way that's delicious and awesome, right? So tofu is great. It's easy. It can be used in so many different recipes. You can also include tofu. You just blend it up, right? And you can use it to like make a base for mayonnaise. We all, many of us love mayonnaise. Of course, mm. the animal-based version is horrible for us, but you can make a great healthy version that's based with tofu. Right. So tofu is great. 430 milligrams of uh, calcium per half cup. Right. So that's even more than you're getting in your cup of fortified soy milk or your cup of cow's milk around 300 milligrams, give or take. And so, yeah, eat tofu on a regular basis. It's easy. Tofu is easy. It's delicious. It's easy to prepare. We recently made a sour cream with uh, silk and tofu. That was super good. Yeah. So packed, you know, packed with calcium there, whereas a dairy sour cream that you buy already prepared, it's probably just mostly fat. Yeah. I mean, it's got low nutritive value and all it's giving you is stuff that's hurting your body. Right. Right. You know, clogging Sorry. your arteries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to throw that in there. Oh no, that's perfect. I mean, all these little tidbits we give people, right. It's like, oh yeah, man, I love sour cream. Let me make it with some silken tofu. Just so you all know, there's like you know, the firm tofus, this, you know, and things. And then there's the silken tofu, silken tofu, 
is again, it's silken. So think of it super smooth, the way that they process it. And so that can be used for some of these sauces and things like sour creams, or you can put it into like some kind of a smoothie or a shake or, you know, like a creamy sauce. Mm -hmm. So silken tofus look work great for that. The regular tofu that you'll just see like in the blocks in the little refrigerator section, usually by like the plant-based cheeses and sometimes, you know, eggs and everything else kind of in that section of the grocery store, um, you know, that usually is good to get, you'll see it firm, you'll see it extra firm and stuff like that. That's the tofu that works well for things like stir fries, um, uh, those eggs that Tony makes, stuff like that. And then of course, think about your dark leafy greens. This is a huge one. And again, bioavailability, we mentioned that earlier. You get about 30% bioavailability with cow's milk or you know, dairy from, or excuse me, calcium from dairy. And you're gonna get rates of up to 50% or more with certain dark leafy greens. And so dark leafy greens, again, bonus without the baggage. With dark leafies, we've got all this calcium and we've got just literally hundreds, if not thousands of other components in these foods that are supporting our health, that are making our health even better when we eat them, as opposed to dairy. Oh yeah, great. Dairy, I get some protein. In dairy, I get some calcium, but I'm getting all these other things that's damaging to my health, right? And so again, bonus without the baggage. And so dark leafy greens, again, but the amount that you're going to get, right? Collard greens here, one cup cooked, that's a fair amount, but it's not so hard to eat if they're cooked and you've got it in a sauce, something like that. 268 milligrams. So one cooked is not so far different from what you're going to get in one cup of cow's milk in a collard green. And again, collard greens are one of those vegetables. I'm going to throw a new term at people here, which is called oxalates. And oxalates are a reason that some of these plant-based foods get a bad rap when it comes to the bioavailability or the absorption rate that we get from calcium, because a lot of these plant-based foods can carry components like phytates or like oxalates, which can bind some of these nutrients or minerals like calcium in our gut and they can prevent us from being able to absorb them efficiently. So one great example, spinach, a wonderful food, but, and it's very high in calcium, great thing, but it also happens to be like the highest oxalate containing food on the planet, super high in oxalates. So because of that, because there's so many oxalates in spinach, you don't, you're not going to get a great absorption of your calcium from spinach, but that's no problem. Eat spinach for all the other wonderful ben benefits that you get from spinach. But I would recommend if you're a spinachaholic, right, that you might want to consider supplementing or incorporating some other types of greens. Again, variety is key here, right? Mm -hmm. Try to have some more variety in your diet when possible. I know there's budgetary constraints, you know, time constraints, accessibility to different, different food constraints. So we're going to do this within our budget and within, you know, those other capacities that we have, but when possible, we want to incorporate some more variety, not just be eating spinach every day. Again, if you're just eating a half a little sprinkle of spinach on something, who cares? Because there's such a small amount, there's not a ton of oxalates there, and you're not going to be really making a difference either way. But if you're eating lots of spinach, say you're throwing a ton of spinach in a smoothie on a very regular basis, of course, smoothies are great because they can help us get in some more of these really great things like vegetables that often people don't get enough of. But when it comes to spinach or beet greens is another one, right? Or chard. Those are like the three heavy hitters when it comes to oxalates from the dark leafy green kingdom. And again, dark leafy greens are pretty one of the healthiest foods on the planet. We all need to get more of them. But when it comes to beet greens, um, spinach and beet greens, we want to be careful because they're super high in oxalates. So they're gonna bind that calcium, prevent us from absorbing it like we want to. And because of the oxalates, there's some other secondary problems. They can be a little hard on our kidneys and they can encourage the formation of kidney stones. And of course, kidney stones is something that none of us want to experience if possible. If anybody's had them in the past, they know they can be excruciating and oxalates are, can be a big player when it comes to the formation of kidney stones. And so not only is it for calcium absorption that we want to watch out, for not eating just huge amounts of these really high oxalate foods. It's also to protect our kidneys and to prevent kidney stones. So dark leafy greens are great. So again, collard greens, 268 milligrams, one cup cooked. Mustard greens, 165 milligrams, one cup cooked. Kale is another heavy hitter, right? It doesn't have quite as much. One cup cooked is 94 milligrams. But again, you know, it's every little bit adds up just like the protein piece, right? Even a banana, even though it's low in protein, 
has like a gram or two of protein in it, right? And so if you're eating your bananas with your beans and your greens and your nuts and seeds and your mushrooms and all these other foods, every one, two, three, four grams, even if three grams doesn't sound like a lot, when you're stacking that on top of everything else and the dozens of things that you eat every day, before you know it, boom, 120 grams of protein in a day, 150 grams of protein in a day, just by getting a wide variety of foods and all those little foods still add up to a lot over the course of a day, right? Mm -hmm. So same thing here with calcium, every little bit counts. So even though kale, which again, kale is just wonderful for so many different reasons. And like collard greens and mustard greens, it's a lower oxalate containing dark leafy green. So we can eat lots of it in abundance, right? So throw some kale in a smoothie, boom, right? You've got a fair amount of calcium there, but you've also got a higher bioavailability, right? Closer to 50% as compared to the 30% in, in, in dairy. So you're going to be absorbing more of that calcium and you don't get any of the baggage, any of those harmful things that come with dairy. Black beans, one cup cooked, 84 milligrams, right? So similar to kale and beans are another one of those wonder foods we all need to be eating more of them, right? I eat literally a whole can of beans per sitting, right? Or the equivalent about a, about a cup and a half, right? So I'll do that. Usually I eat beans for lunch and dinner every day. So, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to meet my, you know, my, what I'm at, right? Because everybody's a little different and our calorie needs are different. And also our palates are different. So nobody needs to go and mimic me but I'm just want to let you all know what's within the realm of possibility, right? Mm -hmm. I eat around a cup and a half of beans per sitting. So I'm getting at least three cups of beans per day. On top of that, I'll have hummus as a snack, right? Don't usually eat hummus in huge quantities, but we're talking a quarter cup, a half a cup of hummus, right? So that's another quarter cup, half a cup, three quarters of a cup of beans because they're all ground down and they take up less space. And then I also drink soy milk on a daily basis, right? That's a more processed version but I'm getting at least a cup of soy milk per day because I just like soy milk more than other milks. And I think it's more nutritionally beneficial, right? There's more protein there. There's all the healthy fats that are in soy and the other components that are wonderful in soy. And we've talked about soy in another episode. You don't need to fear soy. It's a wonderfully beneficial, healthful food. And it's just gotten a bad rap because of big industry players, right? But that has nothing to do with it as a, as a food. It's wonderfully health promoting and nobody need fear soy. There's a very, very minuscule percentage of the population that would experience something like a food allergy to soy, but that happens with eggs, with cow's milk, right? With, with peanuts, with all these other foods that people have food allergies to. Most people, predominantly almost everyone shouldn't have issues with soy. And if you're having issues, it may be because of an underlying gut issue that's causing you to react, you know, uh, what is it less than ideally to some of these high fiber, healthy foods. And in that case, well, there's some other issues going on and you should talk to a great registered dietitian like me, go see a doctor so that you can get help in improving the quality and the health of your microbiome and of your, your digestive tract, mm. right? Yeah. Tahini again. So tahini, I'll let you jump in in just one sec, Tony, one tablespoon of tahini, another great reason to eat more beans and more hummus, right? Because tahini, tahini is an essential ingredient in hummus one tablespoon, super easy, 64 milligrams, right? So boom, little hit 64 milligrams, you know, on top of your, and then garbanzo beans are another great source. I don't have the number right here, but I know garbanzo beans are a better source than black beans, which have close to a hundred per cup. Garbanzo beans are either one and a half or two times that, right? So be think, I can't, it might even, I can't remember exactly what it is at the top of my head, but they're a better source. So you're combining the tahini with the garbanzo beans easily in a sitting, depending on how much you're eating, you could be getting several hundred milligrams of calcium. I mean, who doesn't love hummus, man? You can, you can throw roasted bell pepper in there. You can throw green chili in there, any, any variety of spices you can make up with different beans, right? But garbanzo beans has historically been like the hummus bean, right? And it happens to be rich in calcium. And you combine that with the tahini, eat it. And then you get more vegetables in because hummus makes veggie eating easy, right? We're just giving people all kinds of good things. <laughs> I know. Good point. Yeah. So I just made some hummus yesterday with some tahini and I wasn't thinking calcium, calcium at the time I was thinking, I want to eat, have a good thing to eat my veggies with and make some wraps and stuff, but the calcium adds up, you know? And this is the the adding up game that you were talking about. Beans is one thing that I'm always I always forget. Beans have calcium. And when I was I was looking at this chart from the 
National Institutes of Health as well, and noticing like, oh, corn tortilla, six inch diameter, 46 milligrams of calcium. I would have never thought that either. So when we like, when we have bean tacos with corn tortillas, we don't even have to use cheese or any of these other foods that we associate with calcium, but just having, you know, beans in a corn tortilla with veggies and stuff, our each taco probably has 100 milligrams of calcium. I don't know who eats one taco at a sitting. That's not me. I have multiples. So, you know, it's stacking up now. All of a sudden, we have 300 milligrams just in our tacos. If we add some of that sour cream, it adds up there. Another one that I, I was surprised by was the bread, a whole wheat slice of bread. Now, it's only 30 milligrams of calcium, according to this chart. But you think about it. So you have one slice of whole wheat bread. You make a sandwich with two slices. Now we're up to 60 milligrams. Maybe you put some hummus in there. And, you know, it just starts to escalate, which is a good thing. So a little bit here, a little bit there. Because, you know, I just want to reassure people, like, if some people aren't drinking, uh, you know, the plant-based milks or three servings a day, that's what we've been told since we were little my whole life you know, three cups of milk a day. And I think that's assuming that we're not eating anything else that has calcium in it, right? Because the three cups of milk a day is going to give us our 900 milligrams of calcium. And so that's kind of what it's assuming. So I like that reassurance that like, well, I don't drink three, I drink soy milk on a regular basis. I'm a huge fan of soy milk. Anyone who's even remotely listened to this podcast knows soy milk is like one of my favorite things on the planet. But I don't drink three cups a day you know, so clearly I'm getting my calcium from somewhere. I don't even eat tofu every single day. I love tofu, but again, maybe it's not daily, but beans, those are daily. Whole grains, those are daily. Tortillas, probably daily in some shape or form. And you know what I mean? It the, Here's where it just stacks up and stacks up. Yeah. And again, back to variety, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, all these different foods, they're not only are they giving us calcium, that's what's wrong with the reductionist. I don't know if any of them any listeners, some of you have probably definitely heard the term reductionism, especially if you follow T. Colin Campbell, right, of Cornell University, who's been one of the leaders in this space for decades and decades now. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Whole, and he talks about this um, phenomenon known as scientific reductionism. And that's where we want to look at all these little tiny, tiny minutia, right, of food, all oh, the, the calcium and how it's absorbed and what is the mechanism behind all this and all these different chemical reactions that are going on just around calcium. And you can pick any individual nutrient, right? Of which there's thousands or maybe even more, but there's, you know, at least hundreds and thousands of them in foods. Um, and you can get all reductionist about it, but it's like, no, you know, we eat food and food is made up of, all, it's not just made up of protein. It's not just made up of carbohydrate, right? Any of these plant-based foods have all three macronutrients, carbs, fat, and protein. And they have a wide variety of different vitamins and minerals. And then on top of that, right, the vitamins and minerals are essential. They're essential for us, our bodies just to continue to function, right? But then there's these things like phytonutrients, which aren't necessarily essential. So we can survive without them, but the question is, can we thrive without them? And in many cases, no, right? That's why uh, another reason why we have so many different types of diseases and disorders and autoimmune conditions and lethargy and uh, brain fog and all these different things. We consume a nutrient poor diet here in the United States because it's too much processed food. It's way too much meat and dairy. I think it's literally like 62% of the food that we consume in the United States is ultra processed food, right? If we could just fix that problem, much less the meat and dairy, which we know is another issue, we would do leaps and bounds for public health in this country in terms of reducing obesity, diabetes, multiple different forms of cancer, you know, degenerative diseases of the mind, like Alzheimer's, what we could do by just eliminating processed foods. And of course, that's not going to happen overnight because there's too much money in that industry. And so instead, we got to look out for each other. We got to develop support systems so that we stay honest, so that we stay accountable to the changes that we want to make for our health, because we can't do this alone, right? That we, we don't just like these individual nutrients don't exist alone, right? It's not just calcium. There's thousands, if not millions of other things going on in the body. And so again, don't concentrate so much. If there's one thing that comes from today, even though it's important, right? I don't want to underemphasize the importance of calcium. It is important. It's important for bone health. It's important for other, you know, a multitude of other chemical reactions that go on in the body, right? We, our heart can't beat without calcium. You know, it's essential. 
But if we're, again, losing the forest for the trees, right? That's what scientific reductionism is. If we're concentrating too much on these individual nutrients without seeing the importance of the whole system, right? And the whole system is all of these different foods working together and how important all the variety is, right? In terms of getting all these different foods. And so again, mix your beans with your grains, with your fruits and veg, with your mushrooms, which aren't even plants, right? They're fungus, but we lump them in there with veg, Mm -hmm. but they're wonderful for us. And so the more of these different foods we can get in, the better for our health. And then the more we get in, the more likely we are to meet these nutritional needs for calcium and a variety of other nutrients without even thinking about it. But again, if it's a huge issue, get a plant-based, get a fortified plant-based milk, right? Because that's just a great way to kind of take out an insurance policy, right? I consider supplements an insurance policy. They should just complement a varied whole food plant-based diet because whole food plant-based diet should always be the focus, right? Not the supplements, not the individual nutrients. The whole plant food should be the focus of our diet, period. But when we've gone to the doctor and we've gotten blood work and we've seen there's, there's, there may be a deficiency or we're dealing with some type of a health concern that may be associated with a deficiency in a nutrient or something, if there's an additional concern happening, that's where we may turn to supplements or fortified things, right? Just to take out a little insurance policy and make sure we're getting enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because, you know, I'm a parent and I'm a parent that worries a lot about everything. And so I like, I know I look at this, I'm like, wow, my kids need 300 milligrams more than I need. And so, as you know, where are they going to get that from? Blah, blah, blah. Well, a lot of times, you know, they do eat more food than I do. So even if, if we're getting, you know, eating bean burritos or whatever we're eating, they're getting more calcium by default. But they also really enjoy soy milk. And so, I, you know, that's like, that's my insurance policy. Rest assured, uh, I feel a lot better about the fact that they, again, they don't have three cups a day, every day, but they do have it usually on a daily basis. If not, we like to cook or bake with almond milk or other things. Like it, it finds its way into into their diet. So that's a nice insurance policy and then they do i uh, they do take a supplement for b12 and uh that has vitamin d and the fortified milks also have vitamin d as well because as you mentioned vitamin d is uh essential for uh, our calcium for our bone health or for our calcium absorption is it both that's a good question you know i'm, I'm sure i uh... I've definitely known this at one point, but right off the top of my head, Sorry to put you on the spot I can't with that. remember specifically, you know, it is, it's essential in terms of the interaction that happens in the body with our kind of like the calcium, you know, cause our bonds are, our bones are constantly being remodeled. Right. And so calcium is constantly being pulled from our bloodstream to be incorporated into our bones and pulled from our bones. And, you know, all these different things are going on our bones, right. They're living even though they're hard and you'll see, you'll pick up a bone from a dead animal or something when you're out hiking or you're out in the desert, uh, you'll see, and it looks like, like a rock, right? It kind of looks like this inanimate object, but as long as it exists within a living, uh, a living animal, bones are alive, right? And so they're not just like these hard, you know, osseous structures like rocks that just exist to like keep us propped up so that we don't just fold over, you know, and we, we can't walk, we can't stand up. Um, they're, they're living. So they're constantly being remodeled and changing and everything. And so vitamin D is essential for that whole process of the, the remodeling that takes place and the, the calcium gets pulled from the bones and then it get you know, and then, and, and then it gets reabsorbed and it gets reused and all these different things happen. And so vitamin D is an integral part of that whole process in terms of, from a dietary perspective, does vitamin D help us increase our absorption from our gut that I can't remember. But a Google search could easily solve that for folks. But we won't do that in the middle of the episode right now. Yeah, it's not even that important either. To like you say, to know all the ins and outs, you just know that you need adequate vitamin D levels. And for sure, you know yeah. I mean? And so vitamin D is you want to make sure you're getting enough sunlight. But of course, we want to protect our skin because sun too much sun does cause skin damage and can increase our risk for skin cancer. And so, in addition to trying to get some sunlight. It would be a great idea for most people, and this is omnivores included, right? Because vitamin D, low vitamin D status is ubiquitous, meaning it, you know, it touches all ages. It touches all different kinds of eaters, right? Depending no, no matter what kind of dietary approach they follow. 
And so vitamin D is one of those nutrients that everybody should consider taking. And if you're not going to take it, well, again, you can get some of it in fortified foods. And additionally, you can get, you know, a, a, a fair amount of sun exposure. But if you're not going to take a supplement, I highly recommend folks get tested, right? Get tested for your vitamin D status. So you know where you're at and you can determine whether or not you're in a safe range. Generally speaking, I think anything at 30 or above, I think is considered normal. I think that's, I'm not sure what the uh, exact units are for that, but, you know, just call it the number 30. I can't remember if it's nanograms per milliliter or, or what exactly it is uh, or international units or something. So anyway, 30 is the number kind of the break number, but I think folks want to get up to that 50 or 60 range, generally speaking, in terms of their blood levels of vitamin D, some people, you know, 50 or 60 is more gets you into the ideal range or even a little bit above so that you're not low. And then that's going to vitamin D what does wonderful things for our bone health. It also helps in terms of reducing a number of different forms of cancer. And so we want to make sure our vitamin D levels aren't low. And I'm telling you, most people's levels are low. If they haven't already caught on to the fact that vitamin D is so important and they consider regular sun exposure and certainly can taking a taking a supplement for vitamin D on a regular basis. Exactly. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, lastly, you know, as we wrap up, I wanted to just ask, you mentioned earlier the whole benefits without the baggage. And so what's some of the quote unquote baggage that dairy carries with it? Totally. So we mentioned saturated fat, right? Uh, we mentioned, I did mention hormones to a certain degree. Uh, dairy, a lot of times people will give soy a bad rap because they'll quote, they'll say, oh, es- soy is loaded with estrogen. And specifically, no, it's not loaded with estrogen per se, because only mammals carry estrogen, you know, or, or you know, other, sorry, I'm having a little space out here. <laughs> I was just thinking when I said mammals that I'm like, well, maybe reptiles have estrogen too. <laughs> so anyway, I, I don't know a lot about reptiles, folks, but that being said, there's, there's animal based, right? We'll just call it animal based rather mm-hmm. than mammal. There's animal based hormones, right? Like estrogen. And then there's, uh, there, there's plant-based forms, you know, and in this case, since it's a plant-based form, it's not estrogen, it's phytoestrogen. And that's a key distinction. It's important to know that, that soy doesn't have estrogen in it, or at least the same kind of estrogen that animals have because it has different effects on the body right? So yes, it's an estrogen-like compound or it's a phytoestrogen, but the most important thing here, and we talked about this during the soy episode, is that those phytoestrogens, because they're probably molecularly or chemically uh, in terms of their anatomy, their form similar to the estrogens that you'll find in dairy, they will bind to the same receptors, say in human breast tissue, right? When we're, when we're thinking about breast cancer risk, they'll bind to similar receptors, but they're different. And so they don't cause the same types of pro-estrogenic effects that will increase risk for breast cancer, say in women, right? So, but they bind to it. So they block the mammalian or the animal-based estrogen from being able to bind, which does have the pro-estrogenic effects that increase our risk for breast cancer. So it has a wonderful effect in terms of negating the negative impacts that we might get from estrogen and breast tissue. But then it has the opposite and also positive impact on bone health, right? Where women who are in menopause say, where again, estrogen plays a big part in our bone health, it will have pro-estrogenic effects on bone tissue, and it will prevent that bone breakdown or that deterioration that leads to osteoporosis. So it has anti-estrogenic effects in summary on breast tissue, binding to those similar receptors and preventing the animal-based harmful forms of estrogen from being able to bind to that tissue. But it also binds to the bone tissue, you know, that has receptors for those uh, hormones, but it has pro-estrogenic effects, which is positive when it comes to bone health. So super, super important point there. And again, so again, we don't need to vilify phytoestrogens. They're wonderful for us. And again, another reason why there's baggage in dairy, right? The estrogen that comes in dairy, we as humans, we don't need that estrogen. We get estrogen, we get 
and everything that we need during our first six months. And then as we continue to supplement breastfeeding, once we incorporate normal, you know, or regular foods after the month, you know, after we start incorporating regular foods at six months and older, we're going to get everything we need from our mother's breast milk. But after we're weaned from our mother's breast, there's no reason that we need to continue to drink the lactated, you know, fluid from another species. Right. So just, you know, it doesn't make any sense if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, Mm -hmm. it just happens so that, you know, we domesticated these cows and other animals, however many thousands of years ago, in, in whatever case, in different regions of the world. And we found out, oh, we like the taste of these things. We can incorporate them into recipes and whatever else happened. Right. And it was a good relationship. It was a symbiotic thing. The cows did their thing. We took their milk away, even though we should have just let that milk remain for their cow babies. We shouldn't have been stealing it from them in the first place. But anyway, you know, history happens, but we should learn from history and we shouldn't be stuck in the same old ways, right? We should continue to evolve as a species. We should continue to evolve when it comes to looking at nutrition science. And the science shows that dairy from other mammals is no good for human health, period, right? The dairy industry may try to argue that they may try to fund research that tries to argue with that. But I'm telling you, the research is clear. Dairy is not good for our health. Instead, all of these wonderful whole plant foods and some of these other lightly processed forms of plant foods like soy milk are also wonderfully beneficial for our health. They're going to give us the calcium that we need and we're going to avoid. And then other things that, so dairy, saturated fat, key risk factor, full stop. Again, people want to argue about saturated fat, but full stop, key risk factor for raising our LDL cholesterol, which is the lethal LDL, lethal or bad cholesterol. And then LDL cholesterol is the key risk factor for increasing our risk for heart disease, full stop. So we want to avoid saturated fat because it's going to raise LDL and it's going to increase our risk for heart disease. So great, avoid dairy. And then, uh, well, 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 Gabe, dude, what if I eat low fat dairy or what if I eat fat free dairy? Well, that's going to be better than full fat dairy, you know, in some regards, because you're eliminating much of, if not most of that saturated fat, but you still end up with all the estrogen, all those hormones that we just talked about. There's also the antibiotics that we treat these animals with, right? Um, what else? There's also the animal protein and animal protein is a risk factor or it's a, uh, a harmful thing in and of itself, because there's these things called bacterial endotoxins that exist in, in our plant proteins. And no, you think, well, bacteria, if I cook it, won't it be fine? Or if I pasteurize it, won't it be fine? No, these bacterial endotoxins are not killed with cooking, right? They're not killed with pasteurization. And so they get right through, they get into our gut. And then our microbiota, right, the gut bacteria in our guts will interact with these endotoxins and they'll produce this compound called trimethylamine, TMA. And then that TMA gets into our bloodstream, goes to our liver, our liver processes it and it oxidizes it into trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide is a key risk factor in terms of creating the damage inside of our blood vessels that starts this basically inflammatory cascade that leads to, that allows cholesterol to bind to those walls of our arteries and start to develop the fatty plaques that lead to, uh, of course, blood clots and other blockages that will create heart attacks and strokes and things like that with cardiovascular disease. So another great reason to avoid dairy, you don't want those bacterial endotoxins and those other compounds like carnitine and choline are two big words that happen to be much higher right? And those are amino acids that are incredibly rich in animal-based foods that aren't as high in plant-based foods. So plant-based eaters are protected from those things that are converted to TMAO and TMAO damages our blood vessels, folks. And why do we want to be damaging our blood vessels during and after every meal? Instead, turn for the plants, right? You're doing better for the planet. You're going to be eating delicious food, right? Just learn how to prepare it. Plant-based diets can be as delicious or more delicious than animal-based or just omnivorous diets. And you're going to be doing so much wonder for those beautiful animals, man. It's like, we don't have to bother the cow. Just let them give their milk to the babies. You know, they're cow babies. Yeah. Not human babies, cow babies. <laughs> so well said. So well said. And I always learn something new. Every single conversation with you, I learned something new. I didn't know the term bacterial endotoxins. So I just upped my vocabulary. 
today. That's so a good, I mean, it's a pretty scary that. term, right? Yep. I'm like, out, yeah, it jumped out to me. And one last piece of baggage that I just want to point out, because every time I talk about dairy, I can't talk about dairy without talking about lactose intolerance and sensitivities to dairy and the really high rates or high percentages of people, especially when you look at people of color, um, you know, brown people, black people, etc. And so I always have to throw that out there because I can't stress it enough. The shift I felt when I got off of dairy, you know, I went vegetarian first and then cut out dairy. And the difference that I felt was just through the roof. And just actually recently, a couple of weeks ago, I went out somewhere and had a pretzel that I my understanding was it was vegan. And then that night, oh my God, my asthma was acting up through the roof. And I had like the worst heartburn I've had in years. And I thought, what the heck is going on? Like what triggered this asthma attack? And I couldn't think of anything. I finally did some research. I called the the establishment and asked them about this pretzel and about their food. And they were like, actually, yeah, that's not dairy-free we apologize for that. And so I, that's the only thing I could, I mean, I'm convinced. I'm like, dairy really messes me up. I didn't know how bad I felt What when, when, you know what I mean? It's like, if you have a headache 24 seven, after a while, you don't really know how bad your headache is until it goes away. And then you realize how good you feel without it. You know what I mean? I think that's my journey with dairy. It's like, you have asthma every day. You have, uh, you feel off and bad every single day. You don't know that you feel that way. Till you get off and you're like, oh my gosh, I can breathe, I can run, I can do all these things that I couldn't do with the dairy. So I always have to just throw that in for, you know, the the extra piece of baggage that we often don't think about. Oh, that's essential. Thank you. No, yeah, I mean, talk about, uh, there's some terms that have been thrown out there, right? But we talk about racial, social justice. We talk about a term that you might want to go as far as to say food genocide, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like we've, we, re- we removed the Native Americans from their land and then we wanted to then just give them all these commodities, you know, like white flour and lard and, you know, cheap cooking oil. Right. And then of course they had to make fried bread out of that, but they never ate fried bread before, you know, the colonialists came over and completely, you know, ruined their way of life and committed genocide upon their people. And then with our Latino people or Latin X and with our, all, all the, all of our, you know, African American brothers and sisters, you know, who, who have, you know, their legacy or, you know, history and slavery, Right. Uh, and then have just experienced tremendous, you know, racial inequality and economic inequality. And of course, yes, in all of these uh, Bi- BIPOC communities or people of color, they experience higher rates of lactose intolerance. And so, yeah, that's genocide, man. We shouldn't be promoting on our national dietary guidelines a food that so many people can't even digest by nature. Right. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't make any sense other than money. Right. Just, just money. Mm-hmm. But when in terms of a social justice perspective and, and just, and not even social justice, even if you don't care about people and you don't care about having equality or equity, you know, even more so than, than equality, even from just a scientific health standpoint, right? It makes no sense to recommend a food or a food group that so many people have an intolerance to eating and consuming and be able to, being able to digest. Mm-hmm. And even among people of European descent, who have, generally speaking, lower rates of lactose intolerance, there's still plenty of lactose intolerance there. And that lactose intolerance gets worse as we age, right? So even among these wider European folks or whatever, as we age, we tend to lose more and more of the lactase enzyme that will break down lactose as a sugar. Mm. And so more and as we age, more and more people get lactose intolerance anyway, regardless of your racial ethnic background. And so again, another reason why it makes no, it doesn't make any legitimate sense from a scientific standpoint that we include this in our dietary guidelines. It just has to do with the power of industry and the bottom line. That's all it is. Yeah. Yep. So well said. Thank you for sharing that and joining me on this little quick little rant. But yeah, I guess we didn't end up uh, under an hour, huh? <laughs> Not this even too, close. I'm talking about nutrition. It is, yeah. We could we could go all we could go forever, but yeah, we should just be recommending people get your beans and greens, right? That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. That's that's what I say. Beans and greens. It's I mean it rhymes and they're just two essential things, man. Yeah. You know you can't thrive without them. Awesome. 
thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all your wisdom. Uh, of course, we'll link, you know, uh, resources where you can read about recommended dietary allowances and different food sources and all of that stuff. And any resources that Gabriel mentioned will be linked in the show notes. Other than that, yeah, thanks again for joining us. And do you have any last words? I just say eat some more plants, homies. That's where it's <laughs> at. And then uh, my other little saying that I have on my email signature is eat plants. And then there's a little arrow that part points straight at outperform. So eat plants and you'll outperform. You'll exceed your expectations. But sometimes it takes time, right? Just if you you don't become a marathon runner overnight. So it's so important for people to understand, you know, you can't go from zero to hero in one day or even a week or even a month. Some of these changes happen gradually over time. So just add a little bit more fiber because fiber may give you some stomach upset. You may get, may, may get glass, gas and bloating. And that's because you don't have all that good biodiversity in your gut from all the kinds of bacteria that you need in abundance to break down all that fiber with ease. So you incorporate a little bit at a time, you make these changes over time. And before you know it, you'll be feeling better and better. You'll get to, you'll start, you know, building these dividends on your health. And then like Tony said, once you, then you get healthy and you start feeling better in your body and your asthma goes away or your chronic headaches go away, your chronic knee and joint pain goes away. Of course, that's a reinforcement to continue on this journey and to keep going strong. And then it also, like Tony said, for him and I, who've been on this journey for a really long time now, I'm the same way. If I eat foods that are, aren't whole food plant-based, you know, and, and, and aren't health promoting when I eat them, because my body's so finely tuned now, you have this great barometer that's able to tell you, yo, dude, check, you know, it's basically like a little alarm system going off in your body because the body says, whoa, I'm recognizing some nutrients here that I know aren't good for me. And so it's going to cause a little bit of inflammation, you know, that's going to lead to asthma. That's going to lead to a headache. That's going to lead to stuffiness or something. And that gives you a gut check, a signal to say, yo, I got to stay on cue here. I got to keep riding this line because if I deviate, I'm going to go back to you know, a status quo that isn't, you know, optimal health. I want that optimal health because my, one of my other sayings we'll, we'll finish with this is I used to be addicted to food and this is me here. I was, I was addicted to food and food literally, I mean, it wasn't a huge problem, but food had a lot of power over me. And until I found a whole food plant-based diet, now I'm addicted to feeling good and food no longer has that power. I still enjoy it. I'm not just eating to live period. I'm still enjoying food, but food doesn't have that kind of control over me. Now I'm living my life and I'm living my best life with whole food, plant-based nutrition. Boom. Awesome. Mic drop. Thank, thanks again, Gabriel. Have a good one, everyone. And thanks for joining us as always. Thanks for joining us. We release new episodes every two weeks. You can always email us at plantbased at apnm.org. Check out our website, apnm.org plantbased for classes, recipes, and more resources. See you in two weeks.